Uh, thank you, Jen, for that very kind introduction. Introductions like that always make you sound cooler than you are, so. <laughs> um, I'm really excited to be here, a little nervous as well, but I'm really happy to see um, some familiar faces, see some students that I've had before, and hopefully maybe future students in my classes. Uh, so there are a few things I want to, to touch on today and talk to you guys about. I know you need your five points, so I'll tell you what those are up front. So the five different things that I'm going to talk to you about um, that have helped me and lent towards uh, the successes that I have um, come across are one, we're going to talk about personal finances. Okay. Two, we're going to talk about allowing life to show you your path. Three, lie in wait for your opportunities. Oh, lie in wait for your opportunities. So be ready for opportunities, basically. Okay, four, you guys ready for four? Okay, figure things out. And then five, take care of people. Okay, so kind of the overarching theme of what I want to talk about, and if I were to title this anything, is I would want to tell you to make sure you rise to the occasion. Okay, that's kind of the overarching, the, the general idea of what, at the end of the day, I hope you get out of this. Okay, so personal finance. We're going to talk about this. Um, I grew up actually not far from here uh, in West Jordan. Went to West Jordan High School. Go Jags, you know. And uh, didn't have a ton of money. Just grew up pretty, pretty normal family. However, my parents fought about finances every single day of my life. I mean, epic, right? You know, just everything was, everything was, we can't afford that. Do we need that? I mean, just, it was really stressful. Finances were a very stressful thing in my family growing up. And when I was 13, my brother, Michael, and he's not quite two years older than me, uh, he handed me a book. And he said, read this book. We're not going to be like our parents. The book was called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Any of you guys read it? Part of it. Part of it. If you haven't, I suggest reading that. It's by Robert Kiyosaki. If you don't read that one, read something from Dave Ramsey, Sue Zorman. Uh, there are a lot of really great people out there who know a lot about personal finances, and they put out books, and they are actually really pretty good reads. I read this book, and it blew my mind. It blew my little 13-year-old mind. I had no idea that money worked that way. I had no idea because all I heard was dad goes to work and it doesn't go very far. That's all I, that's what I, I didn't know. I, and I, I never understood why my parents couldn't pay bills on time. I didn't understand why we would get behind, why we didn't, we couldn't drive cars that worked or once they broke down, how we come, we couldn't fix them. I just didn't get it. I had no idea. And that's because I wasn't raised with, with that. So, I had to learn from scratch, and I started reading. And after I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I read The Automatic Millionaire, and I read The Millionaire Next Door, and I started, and then I read It's Your Life or Your Money, and I just started reading tons and tons of books and got these really broad ideas about personal finance. And some of the tricks that made a big difference to me was, one, tracking your expenses. So just like counting calories just to see what's going in um, and what's going, you know, you got to see what's going out. Where are you spending your money? and then you can start analyzing your data. Uh, something I learned, really interestingly enough, when I was tracking my expenses, I was not putting my money where I wanted my life to go. My money did not, I was not spending money where my values were. I spent a lot of money on eating out. Yeah, I have a value of being a healthy, active person. It did not, I mean like, it did not add up, right? Um, I wanted to have accumulated wealth. I wanted to have savings. And yeah, I was spending money on, on things that didn't matter. Um, and then I also noticed I did not spend money on hobbies. 
I, I would try and be really tight. And so I didn't spend money on things that brought me joy. That also doesn't correlate with my values, right? So that was really interesting, really eye-opening to me. And so I started to do things better. Um, I started to have part of my paycheck once I had a, you know, a paycheck. That was, that was a great day, right? <coughs> have that real paycheck. Um, I started having part of that portion of my money sent to a different bank. And I didn't keep a debit card to it. I didn't keep checks to it. I, it, it was Jordan Credit Union and across the valley. And they only have two, two little banks, or three banks, you guys. And they're on the south end of the valley. And so if I wanted my savings money, I had to get in my car, drive 20 minutes, pull out my ID, fill out the form, look up the account number. And so it was a pain to get my cash out, right? I needed that. I needed it to be a pain <laughs> to touch my savings. That's how I actually kept savings. That was a huge thing. And I learned that from one of these books. If you have good personal finances, it will open the doors to you in business and, and in so many things. Um, well, after reading these books and kind of learning about stuff, my brother and I would chat and I said, okay, I'm going to accumulate wealth. I'm going to have, you know, my, my retirement and my money because I'm going to really just save money. I think I'll be good at that. I'm just going to save money. And my brother said, Christy, that is the long way to earn money. He's like, start a business. You got to just start a business that does really well and you can create wealth that way. And I said, no, business is not for me. I can't do that. <laughs> I'll just save. I feel like I can do that. Um, you know, little did I know, right? Uh, one of the reasons why personal finance is such a big deal is because it is one of those areas in life that demonstrates the level of self-control that you have. There is very little else in life that can so blatantly show you the level of somebody's self-control. Can you make yourself get up and go to work and bring in money? Can you put off purchases? Can you live a simpler life than what you can afford? All those things, right? I mean, it just, it's, it's really telling. When you go to purchase a, a business, when you go to uh, start something new, you got to have cash. And I will tell you, banks won't lend you money if you don't have money. Investors aren't going to give you money if you don't have a fight in, you already, if you don't have already a, a fight in it, right? Nobody's going to give you money if you don't put anything in yourself. The only way to have money is you got to save it. I mean, you have to work and somehow get that money. And so that's why personal finances really come into play. Your, uh, your credit scores, those get run when you get financed. Um, I'm sure angel investors and all of those want to know the healthiness of your personal finances. Because if you can't manage your own money, they're not going to let you manage theirs. Does that make sense? Okay, so I am a huge proponent of personal finance. I love it. I'm slightly obsessed with it. It's exciting to me. It's one of my little nerdy things, okay? So I'd really encourage you to make sure that you get that in, in shape. Um, so the next thing is allowing life to show you your path. So when I was 15, I said, aha, I shall be an architect. And I thought, that makes so much sense. It was just this total aha moment. I am really good at math. I can draw pictures, and actually fairly well. I'm pretty good at art, and I'm really good at math. That says architect, right? There is nothing out there that, I mean, I just, I have the perfect skills to be an architect. And I took a drafting class in high school, and I liked it, and I did really well, and I took art classes. And I got to college, I went to the U of U, because they're the only school in, um, in the state that have an architecture program. And uh, why I felt like I had to stay in state, that's another story. <laughs> we'll, we'll touch on that. But um, so I went up there, and guys, it was hard. <coughs> it was not just like, oh man, that was a rough test. I had to study a lot. I mean, I was at school classes from 8 a.m. till 5 p.m. And then I had about 60 to 100 hours of homework on top of that per week. And I had a sleeping bag under my desk. Everyone had a mini fridge. 
one of the guys opened up his own sandwich shop at his desk because nobody could leave to go get food. There wasn't time. You had to just build, 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 build. You had to produce. And then you produce something and you're like, this is beautiful. And they say, that's crap. And they throw it in the garbage. And it was emotional abuse. And it was rough. It was so hard for me. It was one of the hardest things that I've ever voluntarily put myself through. And it was the right thing to do for me. To this day, I still don't quite know why it was the right thing for me. And that really sucks. But I hope one day it will manifest itself. Uh, I do know it gave me an interesting sense of work ethic. I was, I've learned how to produce an enormous amount of work in a very short period of time. And that's actually helped me a ton in, in the business world. It's also made me think very creatively, creatively. So the funny thing is, here I was, and I'd go to my classes, and I would rock the art classes, and I would rock the physics classes, in fact, top of my class when it came to the physics classes, and then come to the design classes, I was just mediocre. I just came up with buildings that were, they were good. But they weren't amazing. And I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay with being okay. I gotta be awesome. If I'm gonna really do something, I want it to be the best. That's just kind of a part of who I am. Um, so I finished the bachelor's degree and said, I'm going to hold off on that master's till I really know I want to be an architect. So I went and worked in land development and did really well in some aspects of it and then found other pieces really difficult. And I said, this isn't quite the perfect path. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. All of a sudden, it just kind of came to me, purchase this company. And I said, what the heck? I don't know anything about business. I don't know how to run a company. But I worked there. I knew enough about it. Um, and I knew that I could, I had good personal finances, so I knew I could probably run these simple finances and I could hire an accountant for all the tax stuff I didn't know, right? So I called my brother. He's been my partner in crime since we were uh, Madeline's age. This is my little girl, Madeline. Um, she's the senior associate in her home. <laughs> Junior associate, Sophia, she, she needed a nap, so. Uh, so Michael's been my partner in crime since we were teeny tiny and we ran a little snack shack uh, on our front lawn lemonade stand and I'm not gonna lie we made like 50 bucks a summer that's pretty good for the eight is the 90s guys the 90s okay um so I call him up he's in law school in San Diego and I said want to buy a business want to buy that water store we worked at in high school and he said yeah let's do it okay so I didn't know how went and figured it out figured out financing and just bought it and just started running this company. And it was an incredible experience, learned a lot, probably learned more from that than my actual MBA. Probably should do it the other way around. Like you should probably get the degree, <laughs> learn the information and then buy a company. Uh, but the great thing about this company is it was such a stable company with a certain amount of clientele coming in that there wasn't a lot we could do to ruin it. And that was really exciting to know that it was a, a really safe investment and then we could kind of play with it and, and take our own take on things. And we you know, added all this electronic stuff and, and try to make it a little snazzier and upgraded all the, the graphics and stuff. So uh, the logos. So we had a really good time and we learned a lot, a ton, a ton learned so much. Um, this was never where I thought my life was going to be. I thought I was going to design libraries and homes and, and things like that. Um, but life took a different course. And you know what? That's okay because at the end of the day it brought me here. Because after working in land development and starting my business, it kept coming back to me that I like education and I feel really comfortable in the world of academia and I like teaching and I'm really good at explaining concepts to people. And that's like, you know, that's not really a skill when people ask you what are your talents. You're like, oh, I play the piano and I explain things well. I mean, no, you don't say that. You don't, you don't say that. And so it took me a long time to realize that that was a talent that I had. Um, and then once I kind of realized that, I was like, you know, I really want to be a professor. So I started getting into higher education and moved my way through administration. And then eventually got this incredible opportunity to be here, which I love Salt Lake Community College. This is by far, I would say, one of, one of the highest blessings that um, has come to me. So I'm really grateful to be here, I love it. Um, it's not at all what I expected, but life has brought me here and has brought me to a much happier path than I would have been if I was drafting or uh, designing houses. I, don't, I truly don't think I'd be as happy as I am here. Um, 
The other thing you need to do is you need to lie and wait for your opportunities. And what I kind of mean by that is imagine a lion, right? They're strong, they're powerful, they're equipped with these raw, innate instincts and skills. And they wait for that gazelle or whatever lions eat, and they wait for it to come, and then they pounce. And they can go quickly, and they can move quickly. And they can get what they want right away. But they lie in wait. And so what I want to uh, communicate with that, with you guys, is that it's really important to be prepared so that when an opportunity comes past you, you can move with lightning speed. That's the way business works now. You cannot say, I'm going to wait till another opportunity comes along. Or, you know, I saw that idea, because let's be honest, you thought of it in a three months, if you don't jump on it, somebody else will think of it, right? It's just things move so fast. And it's, uh, it's a little disconcerting because you kind of think, oh my gosh, am I going to be able to catch up and am I, am I going to be able to stay on top of this? But the truth is, if you are prepared, you will. And you will also, if you're prepared, you will see the perfect opportunity that comes to you. And you'll say, how come nobody else saw this? And it's because they weren't in the right place at the right time with the right skills. So it's really important that you have everything in place so that when those things come to you, when life does bring up these opportunities or, or shows you this path that you had anticipated, that you can move towards it. And then what you need to do is you need to be able to figure things out. Because sometimes things come at you that you weren't planning, right? I had this opportunity to buy this business that was absolutely right, but I didn't know how to do everything, so I had to figure it out. What are some of the best ways to figure things out? Th go ahead and throw out ideas. Trial and, error. Trial and error. Just do it. I love that. Just do it. Just, just jump in and don't things kind of present themselves or kind of fall into place as you start doing it? You're like, oh, I see a solution, right? Yeah. Look at how your competitors are doing it. Absolutely. See what other people are doing. And then the other thing I love is everything's on YouTube. There's a video for everything, right? So you can just, I mean, there's so many resources, so many things to look up. Um, reading books. So if you don't know how to do something, learn how to figure things out, either through your own brain power, through, you know, your own sense of figuring things out and, and logicking, logically <laughs> through things, that word. I don't know, like, <laughs> logicking through things or uh, talking to other people. Find a mentor. Find somebody who's been there. Find somebody who's done it before. And just figure it out. Be a capable person. Okay, there is nothing <coughs> more that bothers me more than when I say, hey, how come this isn't done? Oh, I didn't know how. Okay, well, did you try? <laughs> I mean, did you call me to see how to do it? Did you look at the instruction manual? Did, I mean, no, it, that was just an excuse. That was a way for them to say, sweet, I don't have to do it. Because I don't know how. You're going to miss so many opportunities, not just for business and things out there, but for your own personal growth. I think the more that you dive in and try to do, the more you can do. And you expand upon that, and I mean, we are, in nature, limitless creatures. So uh, there's always something more to learn, something more to do, another talent to acquire. And I'm a really big fan of, of learning something new. I recently heard my old choir teacher play the piano, and I had forgotten how beautifully he played. And it made me think, huh, maybe it's time to go back for piano lessons. <laughs> and that's actually something I'm really excited about doing now, is going and becoming a better piano player. Okay, let me make sure. Um, so another thing I want to bring up in the idea of figuring things out and rising to the occasion is sometimes you're put in situations that are those key moments in your life and sometimes you don't realize they're key moments in your life until you look back, right? But whether or not you rose to the occasion is going to determine whether or not you move forward or you kind of digress. So there's what I, I consider there are three different kinds of people out there. There's the fight people, the flight, and the shrivel up and die people. Okay? When something hard comes at them, 
if you just freeze, don't know what to do, that is certainly your death stroke, okay? But if you flight, you leave a bad situation, you say, you know what, this is no longer the right decision for me, I am leaving this, not quitting, but choosing to be done and move away in a different direction, that is a survival skill. Saying, I'm gonna fight through this, I'm going to go ahead and be okay with confrontation today, and I'm going to do whatever I need to do, um, and have that, that is also a survival skill. But just saying, I don't know what to do, putting your hands up and just shriveling up and die, isn't gonna get you anywhere. Um, I had an interesting, uh, so I'm going to kind of tell you why I ended up staying um, in state. I had always hoped to go to Stanford. I'm not quite sure if I would have had the grades to go there, but I had this hope, right? You got a dream. When you're 16, you got to have dreams. So I had hoped to go there and to go to California, to go and have this college experience and to get away from my family and do this thing. But then this like really incredible thing happened in the history of our world called 9-11. Um, I didn't live in New York. <laughs> I lived here in Utah. I didn't have any family in New York. <coughs> but that event had a huge domino effect in my life and, and took me a completely di different direction than I thought it would. So because of 9-11, my brother had, uh, you know, my partner in crime, right, my best friend, he had joined the Army 60 days before that happened. So we knew that he'd go to basic training, go to AIT, go to airborne school and get deployed. Right? It's exactly what happened. Okay? So he was gone for about two years. Um, and I was a junior in high school, junior to senior. My dad is also in the military. Uh, and he's a senior intel analyst for the National Guard. So middle of my senior year, he got deployed. And he went to Iraq. Mike went to Afghanistan, he went to Iraq. At that same time, my mom, um, they discovered she had a tumor, and so she got really sick, and she kind of stopped functioning. So that left me at 17, going to these meetings um, at the Utah National Guard headquarters over here in Draper, going to these meetings, and they were talking to me about insurance and wills, and my parents said, uh, they're LDS, they said, here's our temple clothes, here's our wills, here's the documents. You're 17, you need to know this stuff. Because chances are you're going to be an orphan this year. So that's happy senior year to me. <laughs> Let's graduate. Let's face life. Okay, that was what I was looking at. I had a 10-year-old sister. She is eight years younger than me. And uh, it was rough for her. So, um, so somebody had to pick her up from school, right? <laughs> Somebody needed to make her dinner and, meet and need to make her lunch. So I had to grow up super fast. That was something I could have ran away from. I could have said, sorry family, it's my time too. And that maybe could have been okay, right? Maybe a little selfish, but maybe could have been okay. And I could have gone and maybe, maybe I'd be a famous architect, right? Probably not. Okay. Um, but instead, I, I said family is important to me. I got to take care I got to take care of my family, and really, I had to take care of Rachel. Um, doctors were taking care of my mom, and there was nothing I could do about for Michael and my dad. I all I could do was pray. And uh, did you guys know Afghanistan is just like littered in, like, what are those mines that you walk on and they blow up? Landmines. Land you know that they have them all over. They're still all over there from Russia. Uh, Russia. Yeah, yeah. Been. You've been. You've been. Okay. You totally know. Like I didn't know this stuff. So I'm like learning things, you know, learning things, figuring this all out as we go. Um, nothing I could do, but I could take care of her. And she needed to be taken care of. So, so that's what I did. So that's why I stayed at the U and uh, I'd ride the train and she'd call me up saying, I don't feel good. And I'd say, okay, I'll leave physics class or whatever I was taking. And I said, can you hold on a half hour? Because that's just as fast as that little train can go. <laughs> and I'd come and I'd pick her up from school and, and we'd do our thing. So she and I became very close because of that. And something that I learned during that time um, was uh, not only to rise to the occasion, not only to just figure it out, <laughs> right? How do you figure it out? Uh, but to also take care of people. And that that's the most important thing. Because I worked for companies where they didn't take care of me. 
Um, and I worked for other companies where they took care of me so well, ex extremely well. I had the most incredible boss at one point. His name is Dr. Art Waller. Um, he's a director of Vista College out in Texas now. Um, incredible man. We'd have one-on-ones, and he didn't, he'd go over, you know, what do we need to do business-wise, you know, mark those things off the list, but he'd always say, how are you doing? How is your family? He knew about my family. He, he would even ask about my spiritual well-being. He didn't care what religion you were, were anybody was. Um, and, but he asked about you, you know, how are you doing? And he said, I know you're a rock here. I know you're a rock there. I know you're a rock here at work. But my job is to make sure you don't crack. Because that's, that's a lock to be the rock for everybody. And I appreciate that. Because after he left, I had another boss who didn't care. And I did crack. I totally cracked. That's why I came here. So I, that's why I left there. Because it just was too much in too many places. Uh, but he cared. So when we started running this little business, you know, I've got high school kids. I've got uh, people who just got out of high school and are, are in college and we're, we're paying minimum wage to $10 an hour type of, of job. It's pretty simple. It's a lot of customer service, right? So the model of this company is opposite of like Culligan Water or Olympus. So we purify the water in store. People bring their bottles to us. We fill them up, wipe them down, take them out to their cars for them. And because they made the trip to us rather than us delivering it, we can deliver the product at a quarter of the cost. And the quality of the water is, is incredible. Um, it, Olympus water is spring water, so there's still tons of minerals in it, which in Utah I think you have to be careful with because little pitch, sorry, I'm a water snob. <laughs> um, and we have a copper mine and we have a, a giant lake of salt. You know what's in your water, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so it takes out all the impurities. It's basically like distilled water where there's pretty much nothing in it. Um, really awesome. Just over here, Redwood, Redwood and 70th, go H2O, okay? That's my little plug. It's actually a really cool little, little company, nothing crazy. But we have these, these kids working there, right? Um, and uh, we're trying to train them. We're trying to, to show them, look, this is our baby. I've got a lot invested in this, and I don't have a lot to fall back on if, if this goes under, right? I'm now stuck in a $100,000 lease. You cannot sink my company. Please, please, you're 16. Please, right? Um, so we started to take care of them, and we'd give them, uh, you know, every now and then I just said, hey, I just noticed you handled that customer so well. Um, here's just a $5 gift card to Cold Stone. And uh, it was 5 bucks, right? It went a long way. And we make sure that at that company, even though it's really small, we make sure that we have a summer barbecue and we make sure we have a Christmas thing for them. We have a Christmas party um, and we give them a Christmas bonus. And uh, their Christmas bonus was almost as good as ours here, actually. And, uh, and they, you know, we give them some chocolates and some cash and different things like that. And so we really try to take care of them. We, we know them. I know who their families are, know who uh, I know what they're doing in college, I know what their goals are, I know what they want to do, and I'm happy to help them get there. Because I, I told them all, you cannot work for us more than five years, I will fire you, because you've got to move on, you can't keep this job. You know, you've got to move on, you've got to increase your skills. So even though I'm happy, I would hire you in a heartbeat. And I've written recommendation letters for all of them. I've been their best reference in moving on to other jobs, because I care about them and I want to see them progress and I want to see them do well and there have been times where I've said please please don't leave us I will increase your salary what can I do to keep you because that's more important right now but and then we'll transition and let us get into a good spot so that way you can move on because I know that's important to you but but also we can't lose you you know so take care of your people and don't just take care of your employees but take care of your own families you know, they're really, really important. Madeline goes everywhere with me. It's just, it's just how it is. And if I can cart Sophia with me too, as she's not taking her nap, whatever, she comes with me too. And I talk to my family all the time. And they're really important. And I keep relationships with my cousins. And then there are other family that I don't really care for. And so I'm very cordial and nice to them. But the relationships that I do care about, I really put a lot of time into. And I make sure that I do things for them. And I have to tell you, when I've hit, when I've hit rock bottom, when I've hit 
some of the hardest trials of my life, they all show up. I recently had to very unexpectedly move. Guess who came and moved me? Two of the guys from the water store. They're happy to do it. Don't worry, I paid them, but they were happy to do it. <laughs> they were happy to give up a Saturday and move my washer and dryer for me. Um, so, bless you. <laughs> uh, so I just want to let you know, just take care of your people. Take care of the people in your life. Love people. Truly have an open heart. And you'll be surprised what, what wonderful la things life will bring you. And I just want to end with this uh, little quote, one of my favorite quotes. It's from, and I may butcher it a little bit. Uh, it's from Twelfth Night, William Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, and it says, Some men are born great, some men achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. So I hope you all will rise to the occasion. What we ended up doing, because I got really busy here and, you know, running. So I still am part of that company, but I have taken a, a big step back. But I still, and then I have a little vendor company that takes care of all their spot, sports bottles. So yes, I did relinquish um, a lot of shares and control um, over to my brother. And they're actually doing some really exciting things with it. They're gonna actually going to move into kind of water storage and uh, send that out to like Africa and stuff because it's boxed, it's really, really clean and it's in medical grade plastic and everything. So they're working towards moving towards that. And the interesting thing is probably if I'd been involved in the company to the extent that I was, that wouldn't have been able to be possible. Right? Because I kind of wanted the company to go in a different direction. But I took a step back, and, and sometimes that's a good thing. Now they're thriving in a, in a different way than I would have taken it, which is fine. And I think it would have thrived the way I was going to take it too, but this is what's best for me, and I really like being here and focusing on this and focusing on being a mom. I was getting a little, uh, getting pulled a little too thin. That's fine. I'm 30. I look good. <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, what are your plans for the future? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I always have like a gazillion plans going, so we'll kind of see what happens. So my plan is um, to be at Salt Lake Community College for a really long time. And then I plan on going and getting my doctorate, most, lo most likely a doctorate in business. Uh, and starting to get into a little bit more research. So I'd like to do that. Um, and then I have a couple little businesses that I'd like to launch. I've got a little, um, you guys can't take my idea, okay? I, I have this e-stylist type company that I would like to start going um, to basically make a stylist um, a little bit more accessible to the masses. I am not a stylist, but I have a friend who is an incredible one if you took a class if you took this class last semester, she actually came and spoke. She's really good at what she does, and so she and I were going to partner and uh, try and get some of these uh, kind of services a little bit more accessible to, to everybody. Yeah. I don't know how to dress myself, so <laughs> I'd love to pay somebody to pick out my wardrobe. <laughs> Make me look good. Click, click, click. <laughs> Be great. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Oh, another thing I'd like to do, as silly as it sounds, is I really would like to use my architecture degree. That would be awesome. So I, um, I want to start kind of getting a little bit more into my creative roots and probably to start selling some stuff on, on Etsy. And then this also sounds really silly, but Madeline is a, loves art. And I figured, hey, why not throw some of her stuff online too? And I mean, to sell it for like five or 10 bucks. And, put it in her college fund if anybody buys it. I, it, looks, it looks, you know, really fresh and young. And Anyway, it's really fun. So I want to do a little bit on the artistic end and, and try going some of those directions. But we'll see. I figure you can do everything you want in life. You just can't necessarily do it all at once. So I, got, I think I've got a little bit of time, right? Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. If somebody's in the hole when you were talking about Mm -hmm. How do they dig themselves out, and what's the fastest way to do it? Okay, so by far the best method to get out of debt is what's called the snowball method. This is a Dave Ramsey method, totally tried and true. So what you kind of do is you take, um, let's say you've got three debts, you take the one that you owe the least amount on. Um, some people will tell you to go off interest rates, but I'd highly suggest the least amount, because what you want to do is gain momentum. So what you do is you have to find some extra cash somewhere. 
So you either cut back on your expenses or you go and work extra or sell blood. I mean, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta, I mean, you can't, make any, you can't make a lot of progress if you're not willing to make a little bit of sacrifice. So you figure out how to make some extra money, even if it's only 10 bucks, and you put that extra amount towards that payment. As soon as that thing is, and you make the minimum payments on the, on the rest, okay? Seriously, minimum payments. Don't add to the debt though, right? So I should back up and say the number one thing is don't add to your debt, get it to stay, right? Okay, so then once that's paid off, you keep that amount and you take that whole amount that you're paying towards that debt and you add it to the next one. So let's say you're paying 100, 150. So you then take that 50 and now you're paying 100 and 150. Does that make sense? And that'll get paid down a lot faster. And then as soon as that's paid off, you take that 150 and you add it here and you're paying 250 and that gets paid off really quickly. That is the best way to get out of debt. If you don't have debt or you have a couple of debts that are, you know, like a house and a car, right? Just throw an extra 10 bucks at your payment. Don't make a minimum payment. And uh, it's incredible. You'll save yourself a lot of money in interest and time. And uh, yeah, so snowball method. You can look it up online too. Um, yeah. What um, made you go to the independent university versus like a four-year college? Yeah, that's, okay, that's a great question. Um, I worked for them and it was free. <laughs> that, that really it, that really is like the the main motivation um i had thought about going um to to doing uh after i did that i was going to go get a master's de another master's degree at university of wyoming but when i started looking at it um i just had madeline and i said well it's free i'll just take it right and i started doing it and i thought i really liked it and it was it was not as difficult um, the material just came a little bit easier to me and I thought, aha, perhaps I have a talent in this and um, kept going on it and I got done with that and then I was going to go and do another master's that I thought would maybe have a little more weight or clout to it, that sort of thing. And I found that doors started opening for me left and right and uh, so I still plan on getting my doctorate and maybe I might do another master's with it but um, that's an opportunity that kind of fell into my lap and I was really grateful for it, and so I took it. Yeah, it wasn't what I was expecting, but it's what came to me, so. Yeah, great. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> that's called a work-life balance, right? Uh, yeah, I think that is something that is probably a daily struggle. So something that I always knew that I wanted to be was I knew I always wanted to be a mom. And I told you guys that I didn't want, I don't, I'm not okay with just being okay, right? I'm like, I gotta be a really good mom. And when I had my first kid, that was a different def definition than when I had my second kid. Moms know, totally get that. <laughs> but it just, uh, yeah, the second kid you let cry a little longer. You're like, oh, it's, it's only a wet diaper, we're okay. <laughs> you know, we don't have to change it quite as quickly. Uh, so something that I was able to do um, from as soon as I had my first child is I was able to figure out how to work out work from home. Um, I'm not saying that it is easy to take care of a child while you're working, <laughs> but it, it worked for us. And so what I did is I made sure that I started working before she woke up. Then we, I would give her about an hour's worth of just her attention, take care of her. And then I would uh, put her down for She'd play a little bit and then she'd go down for her nap and then I would try and finish while she was taking her nap the entire day's worth of work. I mean, I told you guys how I learned to do a lot really quickly. It really came into play. It really came handy. So I would work, 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 work and try and get everything done by around one o'clock. Then I would be available for any sort of fires and then I would just spend that time. I was still kind of tied to my house. I couldn't really go anywhere because I was still technically working, but I could play with her and I could color with her. And that was really important to me. And, um, and then once I had Sophia, I will tell you, it is really hard to work from home and have two kids. <laughs> that was kind of a total game changer for me. And so what I've, what I've done since um, is I started going into the office for the time that I really had to do a lot of work. And they would go to grandma's. Uh, and then I would work when they're asleep. So I put him to bed at, you know, 8, and I'll, I'll work from about 8 to midnight most nights.
and then I'll work a little bit on Saturdays or where they're playing by themselves. I'll try and grab the computer and that's when I do all your guys' grading <laughs> and all of that is a lot of weekends and a lot of really, really late nights. So um, it's, it's going to be hard to find work-life balance, but the most important thing is that you align your values with what you want to accomplish. So for me, I've always had to work. I haven't, um, I, I haven't had the luxury of the luxury or the opportunity to be a stay-at-home mom, and um, and I'm not sure that would have been the right path for me anyway. Uh, I'd, I think I'd like to at least work part time. Um, and then at one point, it got to be a lot. It got a lot to run a business, to work full time. I also adjunct at BYU Idaho, and uh, working three jobs and being a full time mom, that got to be too much. So I had to let some things go, right? Uh, so it's a constant struggle. It's constantly trying to figure out how to coordinate things, but staying very organized helps. <laughs> uh, you learn a couple of tricks of the trade. Like I do all my cooking once a month, pre prep everything. It's in the fridge and the freezer, and then every night I just throw, or every day I just throw something in the in the oven, right, or the crock pot, and that's that's how we function. <laughs> and then, like I said, I spend a lot of late nights um, doing work and stuff like that. But for me, it's worth it. For me, you know, once they're in school, I think that'll shift, and maybe I'll spend a little bit more time, or that maybe that's when I can do my doctorate. I just know I can't do everything at once. I do have some limitations, um, but I just make sure that the most important things get done every day, and then. Anything else I can get in is great. That's bonus. Yeah. You guys, you guys have heard the analogy of the rocks, right? Oh, you guys got to YouTube that. So you have a jar, and if you put in, um, if you fill it full of sand, and then medium rocks, and then big rocks, the big rocks won't fit. But if you do it the opposite, if you put in the big rocks first, then your medium-sized rocks, the sand pours in and fills in, in all the cracks. So it kind of just talks about prioritizing, right? You can get it to fit if you do it in one order. You can't get it to fit if you try and do it another way around. So make sure you get all the big stuff, then your next tier, and then anything else, that last stuff. It really just fills in. And mm -hmm. what do you want to do your other degree? I probably do a doctorate in business management as well. Or possibly I might do it in education, since I really have enjoyed teaching and being a professor. Um, so one of those two. I really like some of the programs up at Utah State. And uh, I, I actually learned about them because I saw what a good partner they've been with Salt Lake Community College. So I started looking into that stuff for myself. Um, or I might go back to the U. I don't know. I got a little while to figure it out. But it's, it's definitely on the radar. It is something that I really want to to make sure I do. Yeah. Real quick, I know for me, the master's degree was so much easier than the bachelor's degree. How was your experience with it? Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And why? Um, <laughs> first of all, it just feels like it goes so much faster because two years is nothing compared to four. <laughs> I mean, it's half the time. And then also, your master's is a lot more specialized. And they, I feel like they give you a lot more credit. They're like, you're in your master's, you're an adult, you're smart, you've already jumped through so many hoops. I feel like there's not quite as much red tape or as many, there definitely are not as many assignments. It's basically you have maybe a paper and a final per class. Maybe you have some quizzes in between. It depends on the teacher and the class. But it is really just you show up and you do it. And it's a lot more specific. Uh, you're actually, you know, you're not taking anything extra. And even I know once you get into your bachelor's degree and you're in your major, there are still things, they still have to cover a broad, broad variety of things, right? And so once you're in your master's, it is really specific. So an MBA is really specific to running a company and to managing people. Whereas there are other degrees that are more based upon the marketing or the finance end. Whereas when you're a little bit lower, you gotta learn. You gotta learn it all, and it is important to know it all. But it's not all gonna be your perfect niche. It's not all your strength. <laughs> and so, in your master's degree, you're pretty much rocking every class. There's only gonna be maybe one or two classes, like the stats class or something, that you're gonna be nervous about. Other than that, they all sound great. They're all your forte. And there's just nothing better in life than knowing that you're good at all of it. <laughs> you know, and it really does make it easier. 
So yeah, I, I really encourage my students to at least explore through a bachelor's degree, but like Jen said, the master's is is a lot easier and it's very enjoyable and they're very understanding that you're adults and so they work with schedules so much easier than the lower levels. They really, really do. So, well, thank you all so much for having me. <laughs>